Alrighty. Um, all right, so last time I had left off talking about uh, Elie Wiesel's night, and there's a couple of things I wanted to say about that before we um, move on. And uh, I, had, I had changed a couple of these slides slightly. Um, we had talked last time about the process, uh, or we generally talked about the process of dehumanization. And in order for us to have understood this process of dehumanization, um, both the horrific aspects, the random aspects, um, all of the um, the physical, the mental, the social, all of these processes of breaking down human beings, what uh, Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel both called the demolition uh, of a human being. Uh, we had to understand what we meant by humanity. Uh, very basic things that all of us share, regardless of sex or gender or race or ethnicity or religion, uh, things that make us, by definition, human beings. And some of the things we talked about were things like empathy, the belonging to a community, the ability to express emotions, to see oneself and other people, uh, even though we're obviously different. Uh, agency, the idea of having individuality, a free will, being able to make decisions about our own destination, the ability to testify, to talk to other people, and to have them listen. Uh, the fact that we're generally conscious, rational beings. We have our own identities. We're individuals. We're not groups or masses of people. Um, we're temporal beings. Uh, that is to say, we live in time. And that's absolutely critical. We have a span of time that we live in. We have our past. We have our, pr our presence and our future. We have our memories. We have our present desires. And we have our hopes about what will become or what will be. Um, almost all of us, all of us have these things all the time. Um, and then, of course, there are all the idiosyncrasies or the specific things about who we are, the languages that we speak, the cultures we come from, our histories, our beliefs, our imaginations, our moral and ethical compasses that guide our lives. All these things are part of what makes us human. And then, of course, there's the issue of the physical body. We're all we're embodied people. Uh, health, uh, our mental and our physical health, our nourishment, uh, all these things we take for granted often, unless we become sick, in which case we become very conscious of our body. Um, and finally, the last thing, and I think this is something that's going to continue to haunt us throughout the class, is the issue of death. Um, it's not something that I think most of us think a lot about. Um, and fortunate, well, I think in some ways we're very fortunate. We may have had a loved one who's passed away. And of course, in that process, it can be very difficult. The grieving process, the process of sanctifying the person's life, of, ta of, of remembering that person, um, the issue of honor and respect that comes uh, on the deathbed of a dying person. All this is about a formation of death that we're used to. It's a kind of dying that is fundamentally connected to our humanity because it's about the respect for living people, our living, living creatures, the respect really that we have for others who have passed along. And death is something that is explicitly, in the situation of a genocide, specifically becomes desanctified. It's something that becomes essentially profaned. That is to say, death is not something that's suffered by individuals anymore. It's something that's suffered in mass. And it's something that also means that the significance of death is something that haunts so many of these memoirs that we look at. But it haunts them because the person's life is extinguished in this, not just the sense of they no longer live, but even the memory of who that person was is also extinguished. And that's, the, well, I think, one of the fundamental issues about mass death versus individual death. Um, it's much more than just a philosophical distinction. It's a very fundamental distinction about how we think about uh, what actually happened in this process of genocide. So we talked about dehumanization, and a number of things came up. The issue of the stripping of individuality, the loss of identity, the tattooing, the numbering, the star, the marking of differences, um, things done in mass rather than as individuals, uh, the isolation, the destruction, and uh, the breakdown of a kind of ethical and moral compass, the things that had guided uh, our decisions or guided um, life up until now. With Elie Wiesel, the profound loss of faith, um, the profound loss of faith and the sense of you know, really questioning how this could be possible, and not just questioning how it could be possible, but a kind of remarkable incomprehensibility, that it didn't fit within accepted grids of understanding. It's not like we can say, oh, yeah, I understand how this could be, because it's just like this, like some other experience that we had. It's radically different than any other experience that had ever been had by any of the people uh, involved. And hopefully, and if we're lucky enough, it's unlike any experience that we will personally be a part of. Um, 
I ended last time by talking a little about material loss. And this is where I wanted to pick up this time because this is something I didn't get to complete this thought entirely. Um, and it's something that in, at first seems uh, astoundingly banal, that uh, when people are put into ghettos and eventually deported, there's a loss of material objects. Uh, Elie Wiesel mentions uh, his father who went down into the cellar and buried the gold and silver, uh, like jewelry that the family had had, or money, or, or any kind of things that we traditionally associate with value. And uh, those are the things that maybe one day they thought they'd come back and reclaim them. It's the, you know, our savings that we have in the bank. Uh, it's, the, it's the money we save for our kids to go to college. Right? It's those things that, that bespeak very fundamental human ideas about what we value, like education or certain kinds of wealth or even material property. And all those things become slowly stripped away so that eventually you have just a suitcase of things, maybe photographs. Right? What would you take with you? I mean, it's, a, it's a profoundly uh, horrible thought, but I mean, you had an hour to pack before you're put on a train. It's something that you know, we can't possibly imagine. What do you take? I mean, what, what, what do you take with you? What's that one thing that you want to keep with you? Maybe photo albums, you know, things that bespeak the community, the place where you come from. Um, eventually, even these things are lost. Even the photographs are lost. And at some point in the novel, and this is, I think, this is uh, page 75 uh, in, uh, in Wiesel's memoir, he says um, it's a moment where he thinks his father, uh, his father thinks that he may be selected, meaning he may be selected for, the, uh, for death. Um, he's become very weakened. Um, it's not clear that, uh, that he's going to come back. And so his father says to him, to, he says, here, take this knife. Um, I don't need it anymore. You may find it useful, meaning Ali, he may, this young son, may find it useful. Also, take this spoon. Don't sell it um, quickly. Go ahead, take what I'm giving you. And then uh, Ali Wiesel remarks in this very, very succinct but profoundly moving passage with three dots at the end, my inheritance. Right? It's not the gold and the silver. It's not the car, the house. It's not, uh, it's not all these things that we associate traditionally with material value, it becomes a knife and a spoon. And uh, in the social circumstances of a concentration camp, like in this profoundly different society, it's a society that's unlike the one we live in, where things that we take completely for granted, I mean, a knife and a spoon, this is uh, nothing. Yet it becomes the fundamental connection between what his father can give him and what he thinks would be the most valuable thing for his life after that. So it's an amazing kind of transvaluation of value, where material goods somehow take on an entirely different form than they ever had before. So in, this, um, in these memoirs, uh, one of the things that connects Primo Levi and Ali Wiesel together is they both talk about this process of dehumanization from, from somewhat different perspectives, but many, things, many places of intersection. They talk about uh, where... Um, Wiesel says we had ceased to be men. Uh, that is to say, there were, he says even at one point, he had become separated from his body. There were two of us, my body and I. Uh, Primo Levi similarly talks about the idea of demo demolition of a man. What's interesting about Levi, and I think and there's many things that are interesting, but one of the things I want to stress is that he's also looking at the fact, the, the, the process in which this demolition happened and who the perpetrators were. That is to say, it wasn't simply something that was suffered. That is, I was demolished. I ceased to be a man. There were, there, I became separated from my body. But he's looking at the perpetrators, the people who did this. That is to say, what would, how would this happen? Right? What kind of social situation would you have to produce in order to have this result? Right? How would you completely have to transform civil society from being a society based on you know, democracy and values and shared goals and hopefulness and things to a society in which death is the defining and ultimate principle? And death is determined based on racial issues, based on racial and religious issues that have to do in some ways with, with have to do profoundly with securing the purity of, of essentially a superior state. Um, I mentioned this last one already, the loss of one's own death, um, the idea of no longer dying in a community, of uh, saying prayers, of living uh, with one's family, but instead of dying alone and anonymously, without a grave marker, without uh, all those things that confer meaning 
at the end of one's life uh, unto death. So I think these are kind of the, the these are the I think very fundamental issues of of dehumanization that happen uh, that happen throughout night. Now, there's not I, there's plenty more to talk about in this memoir. There's plenty that I haven't had a chance to talk about. One of the things that I think in section that I think would be very useful for people to look at are honestly not just uh, Wiesel's story, but the story of those individual characters that somehow that come into that he comes into contact with very briefly. The story, for example, of Madame Schlechter on the train, this woman who people think is hysterical, crying out you know, in madness that she sees things that are not true. Um, but it turns out that what she sees is profoundly true. Right? This moment in which they try to squelch what she's saying because no one can bear to hear it. Or the case of Juliak, uh, the small, uh, bespeckled Polish Jew who plays the violin, right? This, this figure who composes or who plays a Beethoven symphony in the midst of all this death. This amazing kind of uh, almost disjuncture, right, between culture, Beethoven, right, playing a very, and, and also a, a tradition of German culture and greatness, uh, connected with this moment of profound suffering and death. Uh, or the story of Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Eliyahu and his son, right? That moment where he wonders, Eli Wiesel wonders whether the son tried to get away from the father in order to save himself, right? This, uh, this amazing moment, it's like, where is my son? Where, where did he go? The rabbi wonders. And Wiesel speculates that maybe it was a moment in which he wanted to actually break free uh, of his father in order to save himself. It reminds you a little bit of that Pagis poem. You know, if you see my son, uh, you see my older son Cain, son of Abel, tell, son of Adam, tell him that I. Maybe it's something similar. Maybe, maybe the son tried to get away in order to save himself. Uh, a profoundly unsettling thought. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about trying to concretize a couple of things now. Back to the kind of one of the things we do in the class is go between the literary and the filmic um, and the, the, the memoirs, which are certainly, I would sometimes say they have a literary uh, aspect to them because I think they, they are obviously subjective in the subjective sense of they're written from the perspective, in this case, of single witnesses who saw many things but who are telling a tale, telling about what happened to them. Um, and obviously it's subjective in the sense that these, this is what was experienced. Now one could extrapolate from there, one can generalize, um, one can point out, as Primo Levi does, that um, one could speak on behalf of other people, uh, people who can't possibly testify. But one of the things we m mentioned last week, or last Tuesday, was the fact that these memoirs themselves are somehow, are, are very profoundly, um, are documents that are particular. They're anomalies, I said. And the reason that they're anomalies is that the vast majority of people who went through the Holocaust and who suffered and who died didn't testify to what they went through or saw, right? So the very fact that we have these memoirs is already a testament to survival, right? It's a testament to survival, and it's also a testament to something else. It's a testament of the willpower and the ability and the desire to write down this story in order to tell it to other people. Um, and sometimes what's being written or said here is simply, how can it be captured in language? How do you find language to describe this? Um, so one thing we all already want to do when we talk about these memoirs is take them uh, as, as anomalies rather than as normative examples of what, uh, what happened. Um, now, to be sure, there may be lots of things that we can generalize and say uh, are, are happen normatively. However, it's also the point that I think these two authors are making is that what they're doing is testifying in some ways on behalf of people who can't testify, on behalf of people who were silenced or killed. Okay, so uh, I want to move a little bit back now to some of the historical aspects that motivate, uh, that were the basis for these memoirs. So every memoir, although perhaps subjective, perhaps based on individual experiences, is profoundly based on real historical uh, facts, things that actually did happen that we know happened. And one in particular that I want to start with is just beginning to understand Auschwitz uh, as a deportation, concentration, and death camp. Uh, Auschwitz uh, is a complicated, is a profoundly complicated uh, social structure, you could say. 
Um, one, because of its sheer largeness, its kind of status, you might say, um, in our imaginary. When we, we think of the Holocaust, we say Auschwitz, we begin somehow to signify and understand something really large and really horrific. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this short little video. I realize it's slightly hard to read right there. I'll dim the lights so you can see it. Um, a short little video that's just going to give you a very overview of Auschwitz. And then I'm going to look at some maps and also talk about the complex a little bit because both of our uh, witnesses, Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi, both were sent to Auschwitz, uh, spent time there, ended up surviving because they weren't sent to the death camp part. They weren't sent to Birkenau. They were sent to the work camps associated with Auschwitz and eventually were allowed to leave. And that's what contributed, in fact, to their survival. Um, if they happened to have been older or younger, if they probably were a woman, uh, or if they were, um, yeah, if they were uh, certainly a child, uh, they would not have survived. We wouldn't have had these testimonies. So it's also a very particular uh, demographic that happened to survive. Now, there were a number of women who also did survive. Ruth Kluger is a perfect example of that. But uh, many more women were selected for extermination immediately than uh, men between the ages of 15 and 40 which was the case uh, for Wiesel, who lied about his age. But it was the case for Primo Levi, who uh, came there at the age of uh, just when he turned 23, 24. So um, the US Holocaust Memorial website, if you haven't visited before, just ushmm.org, is an extraordinary resource of material relating to the Holocaust, uh, primary documents, photographs, maps, testimonies, interviews. Uh, a truly one of the most rich, probably the richest trove of web-based resources for learning about the Holocaust. If it's something that comes up in class that you want to learn more about that you don't know about, what I would do is recommend going to this website. Um, just you need the first part, ushmm.org. And they have a search bar. You can type in material like a concentration camp like Buchenwald or Auschwitz. And you'll get a tremendous amount of material related to this. So it's an opportunity for you to, as you're reading or as you want to know something more, this is a good resource uh, for you to look at. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this map of Auschwitz, uh, since this is something that directly impacts both Ali Wiesel and Primo Levi, as well as Ruth Kluger, our three uh, our witnesses to Auschwitz. Um, what was mentioned, uh, what you may know, is there's a little town uh, here. Auschwitz uh, was built in a place uh, where there was a t an existing Polish town. The town existed before the war. The town exists today. There are townspeople that live there, uh, Poles, throughout the war. And one of the very profoundly, I think, disturbing things uh, that happens in the film that we're going to look at by Claude Lanzmann is he goes to this little town, and he drives around, and he talks to people who were there during the war and asks them what they saw or what they knew. Um, and most people knew and, uh, precisely what had happened there. Um, it would be somewhat impossible to not know if a million people had been brought there over two years and systematically, daily um, exterminated. Um, it would be impossible uh, not, to, not, to, not, not to realize what was happening. Now, of course, this doesn't necessarily make them guilty of anything. I mean, who knows who could have uh, brooked uh, any sort of resistance uh, to the to the Nazis of this period. It would have been very, obviously, very difficult. Um, now, Auschwitz, as you just heard, consisted of several different portions. Uh, one was the initial, um, one was the, essentially the, the place where prisoners were brought uh, who were going to be exterminated right away. This process happened right on the train station here. Uh, extermination basically meant selection for Birkenau, which was immediate extermination between 1942 and the end of 1944. In, uh, through gazing. Uh, and this gazing process I had mentioned last time was something that was perfected uh, in the early 1940s. They had first started using mobile uh, vans with carbon monoxide. Later, it was Cyclone B, uh, which is the name of the chemical, uh, which was dropped in uh, through uh, air vents. This chemical, once it mixes with air, is very volatile, uh, sucks all the oxygen away, and you're uh, immediately, uh, within a few minutes, as asphyxiated. Um, this happened in this killing center here. Uh, next door, you have the SS barracks and the administration of the camp. You have a smaller complex uh, down here. Um, and what's interesting here is you also have the connection with the armaments industry. One of the things that happened in most of the camps, that, or all of the camps that had a slave labor component is that major German industries also partnered or worked with the Nazis um, in order to use the labor that was there in order to facilitate the war effort. 
what this meant was the creation of uh, bombs, uh, airplane parts, um, often things that were facilitating uh, the war effort. Um, most importantly, perhaps, at least for this part of the slave labor, you also had major German factories. Um, IG Farben, uh, who had subsidiaries, by the way, of things that you probably heard of, like Bayer and DuPont. Uh, they make, DuPont makes, you know, coffee pots, and Bayer makes aspirin. Uh, was an affiliate of IG Farben uh, when it was, the company was founded early on. They employed over 80,000 slave laborers uh, in Auschwitz. Extraordinary uh, opportunity, according to the German, uh, the German uh, factory or industry, uh, basically to get free labor. And this was extremely common, where you actually had the creation of a slave labor facility and factory at the concentration camp. Um, it's an amazing kind of moment where you realize that in order for this to have happened, the Nazi genocide, you had to have a tremendous buy-in, again, across uh, all strata of society. So here is where you have a partnership between big business. Um, this particular uh, IG Farben factory was uh, making coal and rubber, uh, which is also what happened at Buna, uh, which is the slave labor um, camp that uh, Primo Levi and Ruth Kluger were taken to. So this is uh, all sort of well-known part of the history. Um, other examples of the barracks uh, here. Um, there's interesting designations uh, of designation, geographic designa de designations of parts of the barrack, in this case Mexico or Canada. Uh, these uh, are also um, partially because different uh, groups of people came there. Um, gypsies were put in one place. Homosexuals were often put in another place. People who were uh, on their way to the crematoria of somewhere, somewhere else. Um, finally, uh, I did want to mention the death camps, uh, or sorry, the death marches in January of 45, since this is the historic reality that also undergirds uh, Elie Wiesel's um, narrative. So remember where, where he went from uh, originally, Auschwitz. Um, Buna is not shown on here, but this uh, outside of uh, the Auschwitz complex, and eventually making his way to Buchenwald here, uh, which is in, outside of Weimar in, in Germany, in the south um, east port part of Germany. So a very long way uh, to have to, uh, in the middle of winter, uh, be forced to walk, prim primarily walk and march through snow and in order to evade, in this case, the oncoming Soviet army, which was coming uh, this way, eventually liberating camps along the way, taking a tremendous number of pictures, and a lot of documentary evidence that we have from the camps was actually done by uh, Soviet uh, military, um, a fair amount as well by the US military after um, the capitulation of Germany, uh, or in the last uh, months and weeks of the fighting. Um, but a lot of the primary evidence that we have of the mass graves and the mass murder uh, was done by Soviet uh, forces as the camps were liberated and the, and the front uh, moved further and further into Germany. All right, um, there's one other primary source of material that I want to show you today, one other short film clip. And uh, I've, in the past, I've shown the entire film, Night and Fog. It's not a terribly long film. It's only uh, 31 minutes long. Um, it's a film that was made in 1955 uh, by a French director by the name of Alain Resnay. And um, it was one of the very first films to reflect upon and bring the horrors of the Holocaust to the public uh, conscience. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because, one, I think the images are, all the black and white images in the film are actual photographs and historical footage that was created and um, produced during the period we're talking about. None of this was recreated, none of it was staged. Um, and everything that's in color in the film, and the film goes back and forth between black and white and color, everything that's in color is basically what the present day in 1955 looked like. So they go back to the concentration camps in 1955 with their camera, and they see you know, there's no, nothing there. It's just uh, an empty barrack or a grassy landscape. Um, and then all the black and white photos are things that had happened during the period between 1933 and 1945, primarily stuff that happened in the 40s. Um, some of the footage is particularly graphic, but I thought that it's, we, I'm not going to show you a ton of graphic footage like this, but I wanted you to see a little bit of it because, one, this is the kind of material that was, this is the kind of stuff that the Soviets and the Americans had filmed uh, in 1945 when the camps were liberated. And it's also, this is an example of film as memoir. 
basically film as testimony, right? Where you're taking this, act the evidence of what had happened, and you're trying to tell the story to people who weren't there. It's really the exact same thing that Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel are doing. They're talking about the experiences that they went through and attempting to convey these experiences to people who were not there. Um, so I'm going to play this, and it's also going to give you a sense of some of the, it may, I might stop at different places. It's, it goes about seven minutes um, long. And if you want to watch the entire thing, there's other parts that are on YouTube. But this will give us a kind of an overview, a kind of encapsulating overview from deportation to ghettoization to dehumanization and mass death. It kind of moves through all those phases in this short little segment. So I'm going to go ahead and let you see this. By the way, it's in French, and there's little subtitles here. Um, you'll see the subtitles at the bottom, and the music that goes with it was uh, part of the film as well. And the music is meant to be kind of jolting in some ways. Just a couple of comments real quick. Um, one of the things that we won't spend a lot of time in the class talking about, but um, it's mentioned uh, in a couple of the books, and also Ruth Kluger, who met uh, Joseph Mengele, uh, the very famous uh, doctor who was at Auschwitz. Uh, you probably know uh, this, at least the mythology around his studies of twins and children. Um, and one of the things that happened at a number of the concentra concentration and death camps, particularly at Auschwitz and also in Sachsenhausen um, and quite a number of others, were that prisoners were experimented on. Uh, that is, the Nazis were interested in developing ways of essentially creating better uh, soldiers. And so prisoners were subjected to um, all kinds of experiments uh, that were meant to enhance uh, their ability to survive in extreme circumstances. Some of this involved um, therapy, like uh, being forced to live in a very cold water for a very long period of time, being dropped uh, out of planes at various altitudes. Um, there was hormonal therapy for homosexuals who were there, meaning that to, to try to cure homosexuality. Uh, there was also uh, examples of amputations that were done and other sorts of uh, surgeries that were meant uh, in some ways to create better performing uh, military, a uh, better performing military. Uh, Mengele was interested in studying twins uh, for his own research purposes and uh, often these, all of these uh, kind of studies uh, and things were done in very gruesome and, and extremely um, horrific circumstances. So this is uh, what they're doing here in the film, is they're going back to these places where these experiments happen, uh, because it's just another component of the horror that was happening. So this is a profoundly uh, disturbing as well. This is the inside of a crematoria. Uh, when they dropped Zyklon B in there, and you had hundreds of people inside of a, a cement facility, what you had uh, were people uh, horrified, I mean, scrambling to get out. Uh, we know the, the testimony that was made by SS officers as well as um, the special commandos who evacuated the crematoria is that you had a massive clump of people, basically. Um, and generally, the weakest at the bottom and the smallest and the heaviest at the top because they had essentially more strength to try to get out. Um, I had never seen this until I saw this film, but the concrete, they say, was actually scratched on the ceiling uh, by human fingernails as uh, people were struggling uh, as they're being asphyxiated to get out. And that's what this is, this is showing. Okay, so most of this, uh, the extremely, this graphic footage here that I was showing you, um, a lot of this was not taken by, this final bit with the bulldozing and the pictures here is taken by um, the forces who liberated um, the camps. And what they came about, what they saw, were uh, they were hastily, um, when the camps were hastily abandoned, either through death marches uh, or the very fact that not everyone was essentially was burned, uh, they found masses of bodies, uh, sometimes tens of thousands of people uh, who were just left there. Um, and so one of the issues that, that was at stake was actually um, disposing of the bodies. Um, and uh, also just the sheer amount of just horror of, of discovering this. So a lot of that footage, which was widely shown in the, 19, the late 40s and 1950s in the United States, actually, um, my parents are telling me that they were seeing this as a child constantly for years, this very, very grotesque, I mean, utterly disturbing images of bodies being bulldozed into graves, of just essentially massive, uh, massive amounts of people uh, who had just been churned into, um, you know, just pieces of human flesh. Um, so this is extremely common uh, in the United States uh, to, be, to see this stuff in the 1950s. It's stuff that, I mean, luckily we don't have to see very often 
and I realize it's profoundly disturbing to look at it, but I think it's important to know because this is sort of the real kind of testimonial visual background upon which these memoirs took place. I mean, when, when Wiesel's talking about leaving Auschwitz uh, by foot and abandoning the camp, I mean, this is kind of what they're leaving behind. I mean, it's not as if it's, it's, we can see it graphically as much as we can in our own imagination, but I think it's until you see the historical footage that was taken of these places um, right in those years, right, uh, and those months, right before the end of the war, then we really, it kind of, it drives the point home perhaps more vividly than, than anything possible. Any other questions or comments before I turn to Wiesel, or sorry, to Levy? All right, uh, I turn lights back on. And um, if, if you wanted to look more at Night and Fog, I think it's, the parts you saw were actually probably the most disturbing parts in the film, although there's plenty of disturbing material in these 31 minutes. Um, you can look at the film on YouTube. I'm not going to uh, ask you to watch the entire thing, but again, it was meant to, to give you some sense about the real historical um, situation on the ground that uh, Levy and Wiesel are living through. All right, um, good. Let's talk about uh, Primo Levi. Um, this is uh, our second of three memoirs that we'll look at. Uh, we'll wait to read Ruth Kluger's, uh, a, the, a portion of her memoirs till week eight, I believe. And uh, her, her memoirs are interesting in a, in a, for a number of reasons. One, uh, she, only, she wrote them uh, almost five decades after uh, the events that happened. Whereas uh, Elie Wiesel wrote his uh, fairly close after it happened, about uh, within 10 years. Um, and uh, the same situation with Primo Levi, who began writing almost immediately uh, after his survival. Um, he's an uh, Italian of Jewish descent. He was uh, a little bit older than Elie Wiesel at the time. Uh, he was 23 uh, when the Nazis, in 1943, he was 23, uh, when the Nazis came uh, into his town in Italy. Um, rounded up the Jews. Uh, there weren't a significantly high number of Jews of, uh, of Italian descent, at least in comparison to Poles and Ukrainians and Russians, uh, but a significant population. And he was one who was rounded up and sent to Auschwitz. Um, because of his age, he was able to be selected for work. He worked in a labor camp, uh, Buna, which was a rubber factory. And uh, he was a trained a chemist. Uh, so his background is actually chemistry. Um, he was a, sci a scientist. He's a kind of person, I think, if you had a chance to read the, the memoir, he's a, a, he has a very different tone than Elie Wiesel. Um, its tone, I think, is substantially more, one, very philosophical, uh, trying to reflect on the meaning of what was going on, but also very rational and almost a kind of, uh, a kind of probing of uh, what this society or social situation meant, a kind of real probing of what I was calling the social structure of the concentration camp. camp. Um, as much as Elie Wiesel is interested in depicting uh, what had happened, I think in, in many ways a very vivid and gripping depiction, um, there isn't perhaps the same an analytic dimension that you have with someone like Primo Levi. Um, this doesn't make it better or worse at all. It simply makes it different. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do was for us to have more than one perspective, uh, essentially of many different witnesses. Uh, in the case of Ruth Kluger, I think you have yet another third perspective and her situation will be even different, more different because it's a story of a mother and a daughter, whereas Elie Wiesel's is of a father and a son, and Primo Levi's is in many ways a story about himself and the friends that he gets who are also, um, in this case, all, all male. First thing that I think uh, is interesting about uh, Primo Levi's is that one thing you should know is that the original title in Italian is If This Is a Man. It's not survival in Auschwitz, but it's actually a, a recognition of the kind of demolition process that had happened, the kind of breaking down of the human being into this very um, almost, uh, I mean, a truly kind of dehumanized situation that we will also see in Wiesel. Um, he analyzes the order of terror. That is like what that process is that, that, that broke down human beings. Uh, starting with uh, the deportation, the cattle cars, the massive disorientation that was suffered, not knowing where you're going, not being in control of your destiny, the tremendous violence, the filth, the suffering, the stripping of individuality, the separation of families, all these things uh, articulated, I think, with, in a very gripping way um, in, uh, in Primo Levi. And also, um, he calls it on page 28. In fact, what he had been introduced is a new order, 
Um, it's an interesting uh, remark because he's basically saying that the situation of the concentration camp was a new way of configuring a society. Uh, this is uh, astounding because remember, our society is configured in a way democratic, representative, focused on issues around health and success, right? I mean, all, everything at UCLA, right? We have tutorials, you have, uh, you have academic achievement. All these things are focused on your success, right? All these things are a sociality focused on success. He's interested in analyzing a social structure focused on either death or on slave labor. And of course, the two go hand in hand. So this new order that takes place, like what is this new social structure? Um, it's defined by things like roll call and barracks and slave labor and selection. It's defined by, again, it goes back to this issue that we saw with, um, with uh, Wiesel, about being cut off, about being confined to the present. I mean, so much so that he very articulately says on, on 116, um, he says, for living men, the units of time have always had a value, which uh, like hours, days, months, but he says, but for us, the hours, the days, the months spilled out sluggishly from the future into the past, always too slowly, a valueless and superfluous material. The future stood in front of us gray and inarticulate like an invincible barrier. For us, history had stopped. Um, this amazing sense of not having a history and not being able to go to the future, right? The sense of being confined or stuck into the present. And this becomes a defining feature of this social structure. A new spatial construction, you're imprisoned, you're part of this uh, roll call, the bells, the barracks, the uh, forces of violence, and having no sense of being a, a person in time, of having no past and no future. Um, perhaps similarly to Wiesel as well, he talks about um, questions, he looks kind of probes, I think, and in, in many ways very uh, profoundly, he probes the kind of characters or people that he meets. And I call them characters because they each have certain kind of traits that for, um, for Levy enable them to survive. And these traits are sometimes ones that are, um, he thinks, on the border between uh, what we might generally call a moral compass where we know what's good and what's evil, what's right and wrong, what's just and unjust. These things become completely blurred and almost, um, almost so, such that that he begins to wonder what kind of people a concentration camp can create, right? How one maintains, one, what, one knows uh, these distinctions in our society are kind of clear, but in a state of a concentration camp, they become radically unclear. And then there's this whole question, I think, finally, of the absurdity of the situation. I mean, at some point, we, we sometimes see this as the incomprehensibility. We can't understand it, or it's absurd. Uh, that at one point he, he po points out that a band played. Uh, essentially, as the prisoners toiled in labor, there was a band playing. Uh, this was actually a fairly common feature uh, in the concentration camps to actually have prisoners play music as other prisoners toiled. Uh, a complete absurdity and mockery of the situation. Uh, an amazing kind of uh, way in which uh, you have even a further dehumanization given not taking the situation um, at least by the point of perspective of the Nazis, of an unwillingness, I think, to really see the prisoners as, as human. So um, there's a particular uh, figure that, uh, um, a particular, I guess, I don't even know how to call this. It's not quite a type, but something that happens that Levy is particularly, um, particularly sensitive to. And uh, this is something that I think is very important for understanding his contribution to the history of what had happened in the Holocaust. You have a distinction between people who make it, people who had survived, uh, people that he calls the saved. Um, he himself is the saved. Uh, Elie Wiesel was the saved. Um, Ruth Kluger, also the saved, uh, because they survived. Um, the vast majority of people didn't survive, right? The vast majority in his case, are the drowned, uh, the people that didn't make it, the ones whose voices and past and names are lost to us, the ones who have fallen in his historical oblivion. And this, in some ways, is, I think, a very strong motivating factor in his book. He's trying to think about what it is that the vast majority of people are not like himself. The vast majority of the people basically became more and more slowly emaciated, more and more slowly sick, like Elie Wiesel's father, 
eventually either selected or who died out of malnutrition and disease. Um, he identifies a figure, uh, what he calls and what others had called as well in the camp jargon as the Musulman. Uh, and in German, the plural here is Musulmaner. And it's a very strange term. It's one that's actually notoriously difficult for us to translate and understand. But it basically, you can almost understand what this means immediately when you think about the figures you just saw in Night and Fog, those figures of utterly emaciated um, people who are still alive but almost dead. Uh, this figure, which for him becomes a defining feature of the concentration camp. It's those people who had been toiling and working and slaving away and who for various reasons, because of out of physical, um, lack of physical health, out of disease, out of malnutrition, out of just going completely you know, out of their minds given the, uh, the situation, who had been completely deprived, who were on the brink of death, who are going to be selected for extermination, but who are still alive. This figure for him is somewhere in between living and dead. Um, it's a very strange kind of thing as we think of, you know, we don't ever think that we see people like this in our society. Uh, people are generally alive or, or, or dead. But this becomes, of course, you have people who are sick, uh, people who are on the edge of dying. But this becomes a normative feature rather than something that just happens in a hospital or someone about to die. The Muslim becomes the normative feature of this society. You have a society of thousands or tens of thousands of people hovering on the edge of being dead, but yet still living. Um, there's a couple of reasons why this term exists. I mean, one is that there might just is a translation possibly of meaning a Muschelmann. In German, it means just a shell person, a person who is just a shell of themselves. Um, but it also is a term that refers to someone who's a Muslim. And this is interesting because it doesn't necessarily doesn't mean in this case that this person had converted or was of the of Muslim belief, but it has to do with the idea of submitting unconditionally to God. In a sense, kind of being in a situation where you're so overcome physically and mentally by exhaustion, malnutrition, disease, that you essentially give in to a fate or a faith, um, essentially to death. Um, and so this is another understanding, a shell person or someone who had been so broken down that they're about to die. Um, amazingly, and this is, I think, what I wanted to indicate for you in, the, in this, one of the things I wanted to indicate, is that um, Levy thinks that this is the epitome of what the camp did. This is for him, the Musulman is the creation of the German, of the Nazis. They turned people from being human beings not just dehumanized, but into these kind of creatures that were on the brink between living and dead. Uh, they broke down the human will. They broke down the physical, the mental, everything about them. Everything had been broken down until they had been reduced to nothing about who they used to be. This for him is the epitome of the concentration camp. This is basically, this is the invention in some ways of the Nazis in their process of extermination. So this is uh, page 90, if you're interested in, in the book. Uh, and I'm going to read part of this because it's a really, um, it's, a, it's an amazing observation. And uh, it's deep uh, philosophically, but also I think encapsulates um, something that we may not have been entirely conscious of uh, before. So he says, this is the top of page 90, all the Muslims, uh, or the Muslims, or these, these people who finished in the gas chambers have the same story. Um, or more exactly, they have no story. They followed the slope down to the bottom like streams that run down to the sea. On their entry into the camp, through basic incapacity or by misfortune or through some banal incident, um, they got sick, who knows. They're overcome before they can adapt themselves. They've been beaten by time. They do not begin to learn German, to disentangle the internal knot of laws and prohibitions until their body is already in decay and nothing can save them from selection or from death by exhaustion. Their life is short, but their number is endless. They, the Musul Manor, the drowned, form the backbone of the camp, an anonymous mass continually renewed and always identical of non-men who march and labor in silence, the divine spark dead within them, already too empty to really suffer. One hesitates to call them living. One hesitates to call their death, death in the face of which they have, they have no fear, as they are too tired to understand. They crowd my memory, 
and this is the really important part, this is from the perspective of himself being a saved or someone who, who made it. They crowd my memory with their faceless presences as if I could enclose all the evil of our time in one image, I would choose this image which is familiar to me. An emaciated man with head dropped and shoulders curved on whose face and in whose eyes not a trace of a thought is to be seen. If the drowned have no story and a single and a single and broad is the path to perdition, the path to salvation are many, difficult, and improbable. So, the drowned and the saved. The drowned for him are the backbone of the camp. These are the people who didn't write memoirs. These are the people who didn't testify. They're the stories that we don't know. There are all those names, all those families, all those children, all those elderly people, all those men and women who did not survive, who didn't come out, who were selected. And these people are the ones that, for him, are not the uh, anomaly, but these are the norms. This is the normative experience. And so that's why he said, if I can think of one image that contains the entire thing, it's the image of the Musulman. It's the backbone of the camp. And the one common thing is, and it has to go with this issue of testimony, is they have no story. And that's really, really significant. Wiesel has a story. Um, as moving and as gripping and as m we must read it, and Levy has a story. He's pointing out that there's these other stories that are there. And these stories will never know them because they can't speak. And that's the normative experience. Yeah. Nazi terminology, by the way, I mean, there's interesting terms that are used that I wanted to share with you. I mean, Levy introduces the drown to talk about uh, this, the normative experience. Um, the Nazis sometimes use the term figuren and stuka. Um, these pieces are important, these terminology is important because it already sp speaks this idea that they're not talking about human beings. Uh, they're talking about puppets or cut out figures, figurines. Uh, they're talking about something foldable. Um, and you see those pictures of bodies being put into a mass grave. Utterly, uh, they're not human anymore. They're obviously corpses. Um, imagine one still alive. They're pieces. Uh, this is what the Nazis refer to them as, pieces, as trash. Utterly dehumanizing and, and utterly without any kind of human qualities. So these are the terms the Nazis refer, refer to to talk about the people who become selected as nothing more than just pieces or figures. Questions or comments about this? So it's an important, really very important observation um, and a significant part of our understanding of the complexity. Any thoughts? OK. Yeah, that's not this. So a couple other things that I want to talk about uh, from Levy. One thing is that this book is not entirely, um, it doesn't end here. It doesn't end with the story uh, of, the, of the drowned. Uh, as much as this is a very fundamental part about what he is saying. But it ends, in fact, with a kind of rehumanization. I mean, there's actually something significantly uh, redeeming about this book. And in some ways, there's something redeeming about Wiesel as well, because he could write this testimony and we could read it. Um, and there's moments in this book, and it's particularly the section on the 10 days, the last, starting on page 151 and going towards the end, there's a significant moment where all these things that he had encountered in the camp, this new order of terror, the idea of every man for himself, the figure of the Muslim as a defining feature of the camp experience, this uh, utterly emaciated, completely drowned figure. Um, there's a different experience at, at the end of the book. And this story of 10 days is actually a story about the rehumanization or the moment in which humanity and the things that we take as defining of our humanity come back into the fore. So you might remember that this is a moment, it's, it starts off in, in, I think, a very powerful way with his personal belongings. And I think because we talked about the spoon and the knife and Ali Wiesel, I'll mention the personal belongings on page 151 that at the end, in January of 1945, um, Levy is left with. So this is uh, shortly after he's, uh, you might remember, he goes to the, um, he goes to a, essentially a makeshift hospital um, where he's treated. Um, he's still uh, in a slave labor camp, but they're also right at the edge of the liberation because the Soviet army is about to come. Uh, the camp is being abandoned. Uh, the death march into German territory is about to begin. And he says, you know, this is what I have left uh, at this point. 
He said, I managed to bring with me um, all my personal belongings, colon, a belt of interlaced electric wire, the knife spoon, a needle with three needle fulls, five buttons, and, it la and the last of 18 flints, which I had stolen from the laboratory. That's it. Uh, that's what he's left with. So extraordinary, again, is this moment in which material things that we understand to be valuable and important, uh, we're not talking, it's not, not in the car, it's not uh, his money or his checkbook or his credit card or any of those things. It's a flint and a knife spoon and a button. Uh, extraordinary kind of reduction in some ways of what he has left. But yet those are defining things that allowed him to survive. And it's at this point that something happens in the narrative that I think is um, profoundly important. It's at this point that the law of what he calls the law of the logger, the law of the concentration camp begins to shift. And it's primarily through not just the fact that he happened to survive and that others were there, but that you begin to reassemble those bonds uh, between human beings based on things like respect and ethics and um, empathy and also a sense of caring for someone else. And it's at this moment that he says that the law of the logger dies, and the law which had been every man for himself is no longer in force. It happens by sharing of bread, and this is on page uh, 160. They're there, the camp had been abandoned at this point. He was still in the, um, he was still in the quarantine area. They were beside a heater. They had a wonderful warmth that united them. He says, only a day before, an idea of getting together, of offering a slice of, bed, of bread to share would have been impossible. The law of the logger said, eat your bread, and if you can, that of your neighbor too, and left no room for gratitude. It now really meant that the logger was dead. This was the first human gesture that occurred among us. I believe that moment can be dated as the beginning of a change by which we had not we had not died slowly, changed from Heflinga to men again, from prisoners to human beings. And it's this moment of sharing, right? It's this moment of actually a kind of exchange of things that had been human that he documents. This process of demolition ends, and this process of rebuilding essentially begins again. Um, so if you hadn't gotten to the end, it's something, it's a, it's a profoundly moving moment in the book where all of these things that he had d documented in terms of the social structure, the Musulman, the drowned, the whole, the breakdown of human beings, it finally is over. And the idea of rebuilding, of creating a new society, in this case, a society from utter scratch, right? From, from just a heater, pieces of bread, scraps of food, and a few people who begin to actually look out for each other and form a community rather than fight against each other. Okay. A couple other things. I, I had forgotten to read this quote, but I, I do kind of want to read it to you. And, it's, uh, and uh, there'll be two things I end with today. This will be one. And the second thing I'm going to end with is just uh, Levy's notion of testimony. So two things left. Um, this quote, uh, which comes uh, from a book which he wrote, which is entirely called The Drowned and the Saved. Uh, so it takes that one chapter in here, and it's an entire book. Um, and it's a reflection on this distinction about um, what it means for him to testify. And uh, both these parts that I want to talk about really have to do with this issue of testimony and witnessing. And uh, you may disagree with this, you may not. I, I think it's worth thinking about. Um, he says that, I must repeat, that we, the survivors, meaning him, Ali Wiesel, others, are not the true witnesses. And he makes this distinction between the true witnesses and uh, what he saw. We survivors are not only an exiguous, but also an anomalous minority. We are those who by their prevarication or abilities or good luck did not touch bottom. Those who did so, those who saw the Gorgon, have not returned to tell about it, or have returned mute. But they are the Muslims, this is the Musulman, the submerged, the drowned, the complete witnesses, the ones whose deposition would have a general significance. They are the rule, we are the exception meaning most people were killed, most people didn't survive. We are the favored by fate, tried with more or less wisdom to recount not only our fate, but also that of others, indeed of the drowned. But this was a discourse on behalf of third parties, the story of things seen at close hand, but not experienced personally. 
The destruction brought to an end, the job completed, was not told by anyone, just as no one has ever returned to describe his own death. What do you think of that? To be a true witness. To be a true witness, you essentially had to have died. But then you have the paradox, which of course is you cannot possibly testify if you saw the end. And, and it's a kind of it's a paradox, because ultimately, no one can tell it from the inside, right? I mean, it's not as if you're going to get testimony from someone who was gassed. I mean, you're not going to have. So all you have are these, you have this kind of roundabout way. I mean, when you see the film, Night and Fog, you, you can go inside of a crematoria today, and you can look at the ceiling and see the cement actually scratched by human nails. It tells you something. It tells you something a lot. But it doesn't tell you who these people were. Right? It doesn't tell you their names, it doesn't tell you their families, their hopes, their desires, their memories, their past. You know, we don't know anything. We just know that something had happened that was utterly horrific and in some ways is also silent and will always be. Are there thoughts about this true witnessing question? It's an interesting question to contemplate. I mean, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I have one more quote to give you before we go today. And, um, it's worth thinking about uh, this one, but the one that I wanted to end with is actually um, on page 59 uh, in, in uh, Survival in Auschwitz. And uh, this is actually a hallucination. Um, it's a dream that, uh, that Levy has while in the concentration camp. And you might remember reading this part, I don't know, but I wanted to, I'm gonna spend the next, uh, yeah, I have five minutes, so I'm gonna spend the five minutes that I have talking about this hallucination or this dream that he has. Um, it has a lot to do with this question of testimony and witnessing and also this issue of transmission of testimony. So he has, he's kind of um, in some state of being sleep deprived, unsure where he is, disoriented, hallucinating. He says he has a dream about a train about to arrive. He says at the middle of 59, the train is about to arrive. One can hear the engine panting. It's my neighbor. I'm not yet asleep as to be unaware of the double nature of the engine. It's in fact the very engine which towed the wagons which unload in Buna today. I recognize it by the fact that even now, as when it passed close by us, I feel the heat that radiates from its side. It's puffing and it's coming nearer over me. He goes on to talk about his sleep being very disturbed and this kind of dream that state that he has about his deportation. A little bit later, and this is on page 60, um, it says, suddenly from this deportation train, he imagines his sister there. So it's this kind of hallucinatory moment that his sister joins him. This is my sister here with some unidentifiable friend and many other people. They're all listening to me and it's this very story that I'm telling, like this story. He's telling this story. The whistle of the notes, the train, the hard bed, my neighbor whom I'd like to move, but I'm afraid to wake up because he's stronger than me. I speak diffusely of hunger and the lice and the capo who hit me in the nose. It's an intense, pleasure, physical, inexpressible, to be at home among friendly people and to have many things to recount. So now suddenly he's gone from the train to being with his sister to being at home, and all while inside the concentration camp, right? He's having this dream basically of liberation. But I cannot help noticing, he writes, that my listeners do not follow me. In fact, they're completely indifferent. They speak confusedly of things among themselves as if I was not there. My sister looks at me, gets up, and goes away without a word. So there's this other moment that happens. He's talking about his story, right? So he's basically dreaming in the camp of being back with his family, of telling them what happened, and then his sister actually getting up to go away and not, uh, not listening. A, de a, de a desolating grief is now born in me, like certain barely remembered pains of one's early infancy. My dream stands in front of me a little later, later along, still warm. He goes on and basically says that this is also the, his dream and the dream of many others, perhaps of everyone. Why does it happen? Why is the pain of every day translated so constantly into our dreams in the ever-repeated scene of the unlistened to story? Any ideas? The dream of the unlistened to story. So it's not even the story about what happened is the story of actually having been liberated and telling his story and no one cares. That's the real horrific dream that he has. It's not even so much the horrific dream of all the horrors he's in, 
It's the horror of not being able to tell the story and have people care about learning about it. Okay, so we're done today. <laughs>